This is June 1, 2007 at 2 p.m. and we are interviewing Howard Lasker in his Albany, New York home. He served in the Army Air Corps from September 7, 1941 through February 25, 1946. This interview is being conducted by Kenneth and June Hunter. Please tell us your full name and when and where you were born. My name is Howard Lasker. I was born in Brooklyn, New York on December 16, 1918. And what did you do before you entered the service? Before, well, I went to uh, Brooklyn College when I graduated in June 1940. I had taken civil service exams for the state and upon graduation I accepted one of the uh, exams over the positions that I had uh, applied for. So I came up to Albany in 1940 uh, to work for the Department of Labor, the Bureau of Research and Statistics. And I was working for uh, the Bureau for about one year uh, until they had the draft. I registered for that and lucky me I was pulled out of the fishbowl right at the very beginning and I was drafted into the infantry in, as you say, 1941. I was sent to Camp Wheeler in Macon, Georgia. Uh, all of the college graduates that were drafted at that time were put into one company. They called it the Intelligence Company. And I had three months of basic infantry training in Camp Wheeler. Along came December 7th. Our whole company was transferred out into the Signal Corps. They loaded us onto trains and I was sure we were being sent overseas. We weren't. We were sent to Tampa, Florida, where we had set up Drew Field at the time, and we were constructed in the air warning service, in fighter control. Uh, for those who don't know what that is, we have ground observers all over the area who would call in when planes flew overhead. We would have flight plans of every plane coming into the area, if we didn't have a flight plan for the plane that was coming in, we sent up our planes to intercept them and to uh, identify the planes. I was there in a, as an enlisted man for about one year. The war was going on, and so I decided I wanted to be an officer. So I applied for OCS, Officer Candidate School, for the Air, Air Corps OCS. They told me this was impossible that the only one that was open was the infantry OCS, that they had a waiting list a yard long for the Air Corps OCS, they weren't accepting any additional uh, people. Nevertheless, I sent my application in for Air Corps OCS. Now, I don't know why the, what the reason was. On my application, I mentioned I was an Eagle Scout. Also, on my application, the Army had filled in that I had an Army IQ of over 140, which was considered very high by the Army. So I don't know which of those two reasons, or if a combination of both, all of a sudden for the next OCS class at, in the, for the Air Corps, I topped the list and I was assigned to the to Air Corps OCS. Went to Miami Beach for three months, it was a 90-day wonder, and it was, I always say, it was a wonder we survived those three months, the roughest three months of my entire life. When we finished there, we had to apply for a certain officer school. Now, because of my civilian occupation, I applied for the, uh, in Harvard, the statistical officer school. But because of my enlisted man's uh, experience, I was sent to fighter control school to become a fighter control officer. I completed that and I was sent to Galveston, Texas to join the 305th fighter control squadron uh, to work with the 2nd Air Force. I'll now jump over to China to, the, to World War II. P 
people, when you read about World War II, you invariably read about the war in Europe or the war in the Pacific. You never, or very seldom, ever read about the war in China, and yet that is where World War II started. The Japanese have been building up their military might for many years till they had the largest army, two and a half million men, the largest navy, the largest air force of any of the countries in the Pacific area. Japan felt it was their destiny to rule all of Asia and all of the Pacific. And to start on this, in 1932, Japan invaded China in the suburbs of Shanghai. They sent their planes in, destroyed the entire defense system in that, uh, that area of China. And the defense system was gone. They sent in their infantry to occupy the area. Chiang Kai-shek, the ruler of China, saw that he had no defense against Japan without an air force. So he sent for Colonel John Jewett, a retired U.S. colonel who had helped develop the United States Air Force. Jewett came, worked for him for a year, until he saw that Chiang was not using the Air Force that he was training to fight the Japanese. Chiang was using it to, uh, to quell dissident warlords, Chinese warlords. So Jewett became disenchanted and he resigned and he left the area. At this point, Italy decided they would take over the training of the Chinese Air Force. They sent in a training mission. They did this thinking they were going to send, sell China their airplanes. This lasted for about two years when the situation in Europe got to be such that the Italian training mission was called back to Italy. They were needed there desperately. So now there was a void. On Ch Ch Chang's uh, staff, he had an American captain named Williamson who had flown with Captain Claire Chenault in the U.S. Air Force uh, before both of them were retired. Williamson told Chiang that uh, send for, uh, for Chenault, he could do the job for you that you want done. So Chiang Kai-shek sent for uh, Chenault, offered him a job for one year, a one year contract at $5,000. And uh, immediately Claire Chenault started training the Chinese Air Force. During this period, the Japanese had been nibbling off the Chinese coast, and it was coming up the coast all the way they had gotten now as far as Nanking. Nanking was where uh, Chiang Kai-shek had his temporary headquarters, and that was also where uh, Chenault had his training base. As the Japanese approached Kunming, uh, Nanking, I beg your pardon, Nanking, the Chiang uh, fled to Chongqing with his whole staff. Chenault fled with his fledgling air force to Kunming and continued to train his soldiers there. The Japanese did attack Na uh, Nanking. They sent in their air force, destroyed all of the uh, elements there that could have uh, helped to uh, protect the city. And when they had their, all the uh, elements wiped out, they sent in their infantry and they slaughtered the Chinese people. They killed over a thousand Chinese people. And uh, if you ever read about this in a history book, this is known as the Rape of Nanking. But today it is politically incorrect to uh, talk about how savage the Japanese were. So I don't know how many history books talk about the rape of Nanking. So, so Chenault was in now Kunming trying to train the Chinese uh, Air Force. He was having difficulty teaching them his way of flying, his tactics. And so he sent Chiang Kai-shek's brother-in-law, T.V. Sung, to the United States to speak to President Roosevelt to see if they couldn't help him 
with uh, materiel and personnel. The U.S. had just passed that, uh, a, a treaty saying they wouldn't help either side, either belligerent, in the time of war. And so uh, Roosevelt said, we cannot give you any help. However, he issued an edict that any U.S. air pilots, U.S. Army Air Corps, Navy Air Corps, or Marine Air Corps, could retire their commissions if they signed up for the Chinese Air Force. Eighty-one pilots did this. Forty Army pilots, thirty-five Navy pilots, and six Marine pilots. They came, came over to China. And just about at this time, England had ordered a hundred P-40s. And uh, they were ready for delivery at this time. And England said, they're now obsolete. We do not want them. So somehow, the 40 P-40s arrived in China at the same time as the 81 American pilots. These were known as the AVG, American Volunteer Group. Uh, Chennault divided them up into three squadrons, uh, the Panda Bears, the Adam and Eves, and the, uh, oh, my memory, the uh, Hells Angels. And so there were three squadrons that he had that he was training in his, uh, with his tactics. We now come to December 7th. We all know about Pearl Harbor. But very few of us know that at the same time, Japan intended to conquer Burma and that they were planning to invade Burma. They were going to send in the same Air Force numbers and destroy Rangoon and uh, occupy Burma. Uh, Chenault, through his ground observers and his, shall we say, spy system, learned of this. And he sent two of his three squadrons down to Rangoon to protect the city. On December 20th, Japan sent a fleet of 80 bombers and 50 fighter planes to attack Rangoon. They were going to wipe out all defenses, send their infantry in and occupy the place. Chennault sent his two squadrons up through his air warning system. He knew where the Japanese planes were coming in. He gave his planes a heading and direction to intercept the Japanese planes. They went head-on right into the Japanese planes. They shot down 28 Japanese planes without losing a single AVG plane. The rest of the Japanese planes just turned tail and fled back to where they came from. The Chinese press picked this story up and they said the AVG fought like flying tigers. The name was stuck. From then on, the AVG was known as the Flying Tigers. They painted the nose of the planes with the Tiger Shark, as you can see from my little model up there. Uh, we will uh, now jump up to... We were now in the war, and the U.S. Air Force took back the AVG into the U.S. Air Force, and they became known as the CATF, the China Air Task Force. And they were all now back into the U.S. Air Force, and Chenault, who had been a colonel in the Japanese, uh, in the Chinese Army, was now given one star. He was a Brigadier General. But this was a very unhappy time for Chenault, because the CATF was put under the command of the CBI Theater. The commander of the CBI Theater was Joseph Stilwell, General Stilwell, who was a ground officer. And he said the war was going to be won upon the ground. And he was saving all the gas and oil for his trucks and his tanks, and he was building the Burma and the Lido roads to bring his tanks up into China to fight the Japanese on the ground. And what air, air fuel he did have he saved most of it for the 10th Air Force in India. And so Chenault was very unhappy uh, with this. 
And so he went over the head of all the people that he should have. He forgot all about protocol. He went with TV Sunday back to the States to speak directly to uh, President Roosevelt. He explained the situation and Roosevelt and his, all his advisors, Morgan Thau and Harry Hopkins, all agreed. And they decided to form the 14th Air Force in China one of the only two air forces that has been, had been formed outside of the continental limits of the United States. Uh, Schnall became the commanding officer of the 14th Air Force, got a second star, he was now a major general. And the 14th Air Force was built up to a complete air force size. It had two complete wings, and uh, which consisted of fighters, bombers, transport planes, night fighters, the whole ball of wax, everything that a wing of an Air Force wing should have. But with all of these planes and with the, uh, his ground observer system, uh, Chang uh, Kai shek had provided ground observers all over uh, China that reported back when Japanese planes flew overhead. And so Chenault said, I need an, a fighter control squadron to work with these ground observers. That brings us back to where I left you, where I was at Galveston, Texas with the, fifth, uh, with, with the 305th fighter control squadron. When uh, Chenault asked for a fighter control squadron, the 14 officers in the 305th, we were transferred out, shipped to Marchfield in Riverside, California, where we were joined with 212 enlisted men, and we became the 317th Fighter Control Squadron. We were loaded on trains, shipped back to the East Coast, and at Newport News, we were loaded on a, a Liberty ship, a little, little tub of a ship, and we went across the Atlantic to Iran, Algeria. There, uh, we were there about six weeks, then we were loaded on a, what had been a British luxury liner, the Ranchi, and uh, we were sh sh boarded the ship, across the Mediterranean, through the, West, the Suez Canal, up through the Indian Ocean, and we uh, arrived at Bombay, India. Bombay, India, we were loaded on the trains, flown, uh, we driven across, to Calcutta. Calcutta, we were put on planes up into Chengdu, China. When we got off the planes in Chengdu, Hank Greenberg, the baseball player, was there on the tarmac shaking hands and welcoming each of us to China. A great publicity stunt. So here we are, 14 controllers in Chengdu. Too many for the work we had to do there. We worked an eight-hour shift, so three of us worked a day. So a bunch of the guys were made PX officers, uh, quartermaster officers, all sorts of things. I was one of the lucky ones and remained a fighter control officer. And I was on duty one night when we, uh, the, the CBI theater decided they wanted to send their B-29s up to Manchuria to bomb the Japanese factories up there. And so we knew they were coming up. They came, they landed on our field to refuel, but the Japanese spy system also knew they had come up and were on our field. So the Japanese sent a wave of planes to hit the B-29 bombers on the field and destroy them before they ever could take off. As I say, I, as fate had it, I was the controller on duty that evening when I get the calls that the Japanese pl uh, planes are coming in. Now, I was the controller on duty, but in charge of the operation was a full colonel, and he is supposed to tell me what to do. Instead, he's running around the building yelling, where's my helmet, where's my helmet? The building was revetted with sandbags. If bombs had dropped on the field, the building was safe. If a bomb landed right on our building, a helmet was not going to be that much help. 
But anyway, I was sitting there waiting for her instructions what to do. And I see the Japanese planes are coming in. If we don't send up our planes in time, we'll be too late to intercept the Japanese planes. So on my own initiative, I scrambled our planes, gave them a heading to intercept the Japanese planes, and I was successful. Our planes hit the Japanese planes. Japanese planes dropped their bombs where they were, turned tail, and fled. We didn't shoot down a single Japanese plane one then, but the only damage done that night was some rice paddies 100 miles away from Chengdu. Chengdu was safe, our B-29s were safe. The next morning, the colonel comes up to me and he says, yesterday you saved my butt, I owe you one. What does it mean when a colonel says to a first lieutenant, I owe you one? I felt I was gonna get a drink in the officers club once a night. But I was wrong. Two weeks later, he comes over to me and he says, we are opening up an abandoned airfield up in Xi'an, which was south of the Yellow River. The Japanese had an airfield on the north side of the Yellow River. And he said, we're going to open up a base there. We're going to have a fighter control squadron up there. If you want to be the commanding officer of the fighter control squadron up there, the job is yours. Now, I was 26 years old at the time, and when you're 26, your brain isn't completely developed. Here I am now, 400 miles away from the nearest Japanese airfield, and he's asking me if I want to go up to be 20 miles away from a Japanese airfield. I gave him the fastest yes, sir, he ever received. So two weeks later, they uh, loaded me on a plane with eight enlisted men and all the equipment to set up a fighter control squadron. Now that I think about it, they must have felt we were expendable, that they were only sending one officer and eight enlisted men, and if the Japanese came across the river, they weren't going to lose too many people. But the Japanese never did come across the river. My instructions were that if I saw them coming, I was to evacuate as fast as I could, because the field was protected by a Chinese company of infantry. And I was told if the Japanese are coming across the river, the Japanese infantry will be a hundred feet ahead of you, running uh, away. So I set up my fighter control squadron down in a uh, bomb shelter. I was eight feet underground and uh, operated from there. The Japanese did send over planes. They bombed us. They knocked my antenna down, but we were safe. No damage was done. And so we were uh, very successful. A month later, they sent me a lieutenant and about 20 more enlisted men. A few months later, they sent me several more officers and more enlisted men, until I finally had a full squadron uh, up there. The, we were working with the planes from the 311th uh, fighter group, which were commanded by G Colonel John Chenault, Claire Chenault's son. So Claire Chenault would come up and visit his son about once a month. And when he came up, he always stopped down at my place and he always said, I like what I see, you're doing a good job, keep up the good work. I was very happy because normally a uh, general would, to show he's the boss, would tell you, do something this way, do something, just to show that he was the boss. Never said that to me. He says, what you're doing is great, just keep it up. So we were very successful there. Uh, not a single Japanese raid came into our area of the north, northern third of China. So we had Kunming was protecting the southern third, Chengdu had, uh, was protecting the middle third, and now in Xi'an we were protecting the top third of China. And we were very successful. We, uh, not, as I say, not a single Japanese raid was made in our area successfully without being intercepted. The uh, provincial governor of the province, where this was Shenzi province, gave me the Provincial Medal of Honor for doing such a good job in protecting his province. General Chenault felt I was doing a good job too, and he ordered a Bronze Star Medal uh, mm -hmm. for me for outstanding performance of duty. So we were very successful. As a matter of fact, the, in, 
the uh, Flying Tigers, which started with the uh, AVG, which continued with the CATF, and now the 14th Air Force Flying Tigers, we set a record, or I should say the Flying Tigers set a record that has never been equaled and probably will never be equaled. A record of 20 to 1. 20 Japanese planes shot down to one plane that we lost. We shot down 2,000, I remember the number, 2,135 Japanese planes from 1941 to 1945. Well, we only lost 118 planes of our own. And we didn't lose all of the pilots, because if the pilots bailed out and they got down safely, the Chinese farmers would always rush to them and help them and uh, walk them out. Uh, I have a favorite walkout story, if I have time to tell it here. Uh, one pilot landed, and, uh, in his parachute, surrounded by the Chinese farmers, and they said, come on, this will save you. But one of the guys, farmers said, give me your boots. And the pilot said, here, here they're saving me, and already they're going to steal my boots. The uh, farmer puts the boots on and starts running up the muddy road. The farmers take the pilot to their village. That night, the farmer comes back to the village with the boots around his neck and gives them back. What he had done was he had run up the road making f footprints with these big Air Force boots. The Japanese coming to the pl down plane, seeing the uh, footprints in the muddy road, went up the road for several miles away from the village uh, trying to find the pilot. Damn ch clever these mm. Chinese. Uh, so as I say, we were very successful uh, during those years. Uh, we all wore on our backs a little, let me see, can I turn it off a second? And I'll get out something from down here. I'm going to start. Uh, Go ahead. There is to say. Uh, what about that, you, you mentioned you were about on, the, on your back, what was that? Yes, we wore them, it was sewn onto the back of our jackets. We could, they were called blood chits. Why they had that name, I have no idea. But it was a Chinese flag on the top half, national Chinese flag, and the bottom half was Chinese writing, which roughly translated said, uh, the wearer of this is an American who has come here to aid us. If he needs help, give him all the help you can. And the ch ch Chinese were, were very helpful to any pilot that they could uh, bring back. There are a lot of walkout stories. One fellow got, was t down, and the farmers were so delighted with him, they had a sedan chair. They put him up in a sedan chair, and they carried him on their shoulders. He didn't even have to walk out. They carried him out to, from village to village till they got him back to, uh, his, uh, to an air base. Yeah. What kind of food did they feed the soldiers? Chinese food. This was it. We had Chinese infantry guarding our field. We had Chinese chefs uh, cooking Chinese food for us. There's no beef in China. All there was was pigs and chickens. So we bacon and eggs for breakfast every morning. And then one day it would be pork for lunch, chicken for dinner. The next day it would be chicken for lunch and pork for dinner. Now, I'm a good Jewish boy, and I had never eaten pork in my life. <laughs> but uh, when, when I went into the Army, when, we, when I was drafted, we were addressed by a rabbi. And he said, sometime in your career, you may be in a place where the only thing to eat will be pig. You have to keep your strength up. You eat it. So I ate pork for two years. Every way you can think of it. Uh, roast pork, broiled pork, uh, fried pork, you name it, they varied the way that he prepared it uh, for us. Uh, but it was all, still always pork. Did you have a lot of rice, I assume? No was... rice at all. Oh, really? I was up in North China. North okay. China is the same latitude as New York. 
So whereas the southern half of China is a rice growing area with the rice paddies that I mentioned uh, earlier, up in the north China it's strictly a wheat belt and all they grow is wheat. So we uh, had noodles. Uh, the staple was noodles. They had a nice thick bread and noodles, all the wheat we needed, no rice. Mm. And did they make the uh, soups by chance up there? Uh, we didn't get too much soup as I remember. Uh, I don't recall too much soup. It was mm. basically meat and, meat and vegetables. We got a lot of cabbage. Cabbage was a... Mm -hmm. But we were told that we couldn't eat anything in town or anywhere that hadn't been boiled first because they used uh, for fertilizer human excrement and so nothing without being boiled I still remember three Chinese words Ling Kai Sui cold boiled water if you went someplace and wanted water <coughs> it had to be boiled before they cooled it off for you but I have a, other f uh, memories. I, as I said, I when I had nothing to do, after a while when I the, we drove the Japanese out of our area, uh, we finally uh, we were having no incoming raids, so I sent our planes up the Chinese railway, which was on the north side of the Yellow River, uh, bombing and strafing the trains and blowing up the engines so that the uh, railroad's engines were in the, the stockyards uh, continuously. They, so they couldn't get bring in supplies and that's why the Japanese airfield north of us finally had to be evacuated because they were getting no supplies. And so but when I had uh, enough service people, uh, people working with me, on my time off I would go into town and I became friendly with all of the, uh, the Chinese antique dealers. So much so that uh, I became good friends with them, and which normally they didn't do for uh, an American. They invited me to their homes to dinner with them, and I would sit at the dinner tables with them. And the dinner tables were always round tables with a lazy Susan in the center and the food, uh, all the dishes would be put on there that spin that around and you help yourself to whatever you wanted. You didn't want this dish, you just passed it and went to the next dish. And this was just for the men only. The women had sat at another little smaller table in the corner and with the same type of table, but uh, we never ate uh, with the women, Ex with one exception. So after I'd been there quite a while, they decided they would give me an American-style dinner. Out of, I don't know where they found it. They found a little handmade ice cream maker. So we sit down for dinner. The first course is ice cream. They gave, gave us ice cream. The main course was steak. Now this was a water buffalo that had died from overwork. And they were all muscled those water buffalo. And this steak was was solid muscle. But they gave me, and the final course was a bowl of soup. They did serve soup as the final course. And something else, all the times that I had been eating with them, they provided me with chopsticks, and we all used chopsticks to eat. For this meal, they had made knives, forks, and spoons. They were all perfectly flat. Their spoon had no indentation, and the, the fork was completely... And so when I ate with the, uh, the Chinese meals, the children would always laugh at me when they saw me trying to manipulate chopsticks. Here it was my turn to laugh. The kids could not manipulate a, a fork. They could not eat with a spoon, and it was my turn to laugh at the children. But I got along fine with them. We had... Uh, great times together. So let me think, what else might I need? Might How did about? they supply you out there? Everything came over the hump. Flew, flown up from India. 
Everything we needed was flown up from India. Uh, we had one, one of my enlisted men was drafted when he was about six foot two. They drafted him up to that point. But he was only 18 years old at the time he was drafted. And by this time, he's 20, he has now grown to six foot eight inches. They didn't have uniforms his size. They had to send for uniforms for his size. I don't know where from the States or where. And twice a year, they sent up a complete uniform for him by over the hump to him. So twice a year, he got a new uniform because of his size. The rest of us got it from the regular quartermaster, and we got, only got them when we needed them. If we needed a pair of shoes, we went to the quartermaster, said we need a pair of shoes, and we'd be given them. He got the shoes whether he needed them or not. I had great enlisted men. I uh, enjoyed working with my enlisted men. Uh, so much so that with the enlisted men that I worked with, when I was working closely with them, we were on a first name basis. I called them by their first name, they called me by my first name. If anybody came in the, into the area, it was immediately Captain Lasker. But, uh, but when we were alone together, first names. I didn't mention that, that when I was sent up to uh, CN, I had given con the, uh, the command of the, fire, of the, of the squadron they gave me a promotion to, I became a captain from my, whereas I had been a first lieutenant back in Cheng too. So what else can I tell you? What did you do for recreational purposes? Did, did you ever get R&R &R out of the area? Did they fly no. you out? No. What about medical no. treatment available for everybody? Medical here? treatment, they finally did uh, open up a hospital uh, up there or when we were had the full squadron of fighter control, full squadrons of planes. They opened up a hospital with doctors. In the time that I was there, I only needed to, to go to the hospital once. I, we had mosquito netting around our beds with posts in the four corners. And when I went to bed at night, it hang your shirt up on, the cor on one of the posts. Well, one morning I got up to run to, to breakfast and I put on my shirt and I'm running to and all of a sudden, I'm stung in the back of my neck. And I reach up, and there was a big scorpion on the back of my collar. And I didn't see it when I put the shirt on, and he stung me in my neck. So instead of going to the mess hall, I veered over and I went to the hospital. And by the time I got to the hospital, my whole neck and shoulder was paralyzed. I had complete no movement, completely paralyzed. Not petting the pain, but just no, no movement. So they put hot compresses on the uh, scorpion bite, and in about an hour or so, uh, feeling came back and uh, I was all right. But uh, you say recreation. No, we didn't have any recreation uh, there. We were all by ourselves. There was no, nobody else uh, there. Uh, Did you have... Uh any means of finding out how the war was progressing, how things were back home. What about mail calls? Oh, we got mail over the hump uh, on an irregular basis. Uh, my wife would write me every day, and I would usually get about eight letters <laughs> in one batch. And so they had to fly everything up over the hump. One other thing that I uh, like to mention was, as I said, I am Jewish. And on the Jewish High Holy Days, they decided they could have services for the Jewish um, servicemen. So all the Jewish men who wanted to go to services were boarded on planes wherever they were, and we were all flown to a central place. I was a captain, and they said, you're the ranking officer here. You're in charge of the service. Unfortunately, I didn't know enough about running a, a service, but some of my enlisted men did. And we've had Jewish uh, High Holy Day services uh, in China. Uh, the government did provide that for us. Uh, there's one other story I would like to tell. Some of the things that I had to do, in addition to sending my planes out 
to, uh, to intercept Japanese planes, I had to worry that they all got back to the base safely. And on several occasions, on one occasion on particular I'll mention, I get a call from one of the pi my pilots saying, I'm lost, I'm lost. I, I don't know where I am. I got separated from the outfit and I don't know where I am. All the Chinese mountains look exactly like every other Chinese mountain. He's I'm flying over these mountains, I don't have any idea. Bring me back, bring me back. So I said to, I had a topographical map of the area. I said, describe what you're flying over. And so he described, was describing what he was flying over, and he finally said, I'm flying over a crescent-shaped lake. On my map, I see a crescent-shaped lake. And so I said to him, keep on the heading you're going, and in a few minutes you're going to be flying between two peaks 5,000 feet tall. A few minutes later, he called me back and said, I'm flying between two peaks 5,000 feet tall. I knew where he was, I knew I had him spotted, and I brought him back uh, to the base. That night, the entire squadron came down to my fighter control center carrying the case of stateside beer that they had flown up from. Um, they had attached it under the wings of their plane so that it was nice and cold. They all came down, the whole squadron, to my, and they gave me a beer party for saving this guy's life. His name was Ken Everett. Uh, and from that time on, I was one of the boys as far as the squadron was concerned. Up to that point, ground personnel was here, pilots are there, you didn't mix. But from that day on, I was one of the boys with the pilots because they knew they could depend upon me. I did this several times uh, again later on, uh, bringing back uh, lost pilots. But uh, I'll never forget that. And speaking of this Ken Eric, the 14th Air Force Flying Tigers have a reunion. How, how, this will be the last year they have one. They're going out of business this year. There not enough of us left alive to continue. But uh, the, one of the reunions I went to in Atlanta, I met this Ken Errett again, and he was there with his wife, and he brings his wife over to me and he says, this is the man who saved my life. And I felt so warm inside. Uh, it was quite a nice reunion we had there. We get there, at that time, the uh, 14th Air Force Flying Tiger headquarters was at Dobbins Air Base in Atlanta. We get there, there's a big tarp over uh, a big mound of something, we, we don't know what it is. And they had a ceremony, and they pulled the tarp off, and it was a P-40 that had been brought back. Uh, somebody had found, uh, they had found it in the jungles in China, and some restaurant owner in California, at his own expense, brought it, had it brought back, and he had it restored at his expense, donated it to the 14th Air Force, and here it was mounted on a concrete pylon. When we saw that P-40 with this tiger shark painted on it, chills went up and down our backs. You can't imagine the thrill it was mm -hmm. to see uh, that plane. Now, if you notice, uh, the yellow nose in this plane. That represents the yellow scorpions. Each squadron mm -hmm. painted the nose of their planes a certain color. And, uh, and the yellow scorpions painted their noses yellow. But that's an interesting story I didn't tell you. That when, I, when we intercepted those Japanese planes uh, in Burma, when they were coming into Rangoon, they, they came in on the December 20th. They came in again on December 23rd. Same results. They came in again on January 1st. And this time it was the same results except we lost one Flying Tiger plane. So for the three raids that they made, we shot down, uh, I think it was 68 Japanese planes and lost only one. And the Japanese never did it, it came in again. Their spies had told them that Chenault had only two squadrons of planes protecting Rangoon. But the, the Japanese Air Force knew differently. They knew we had ten squadrons 
defending Je uh, Rangoon. How did they know this? Because each morning, Chenault had the squadrons change the colors of the noses of the planes. So one day, they were intercepted by planes with red noses and green noses. The next the raid, they were intercepted by planes with blue noses and yellow noses. The next the time, white noses and black noses. And the Japanese planes that returned to their base knew there were 10 squadrons out there uh, attacking them. Chenault was a genius. And uh, why were we that as successful as we were? Were our pilots better than the Japanese pilots? Possibly so, but that wasn't the entire reason why we were as successful as we were. It was because of General Chenault. He was a genius, to my mind, an aerial tactician genius. He gave his pilots instructions that no other Air Force general uh, gave to their pilots wherever they were fighting the Japanese. Chenault had studied the Japanese Zeros and he saw they were faster and more maneuverable than our planes, but they were lighter than our planes. And so he gave his pilots instructions. You climb above the Japanese planes when you're coming in at them. Come in from a higher altitude and make a dive at the Japanese planes with all six of your 50 caliber machine guns blazing away. If you do not get the plane on that first uh, run, go into a steep dive. The Japanese planes were so flimsy, I use the word flimsy, they could not go into a steep dive because their wings would snap off. So he was go into a steep dive, climb around, come up above them, and make another pass. Uh, nobody else has, uh, saw that, but he said you never, never, ever get into a dogfight with a Japanese Zero. They're lighter and more maneuverable than you are. They're faster than you are. If you get into a dogfight, they'll be on your tail before you know it. So never get into a, do a dogfight. And he, that was, uh, I would say, was one of the reasons for the success uh, of the uh, Flying Tigers. Were you kept abreast uh, of what was going on in the Pacific? Uh how the fleet was advancing and the troops were advancing, the marines uh, were occupying uh, the territories held by the they Japanese. They sent to us the Stars and Stripes, the newspaper, the uh, uh, military newspaper. So we did see, read in the newspaper what was going on in Europe, what was going on in the Pacific. Uh, other than that, we were not kept the rest of it. Uh, we had no means. Uh, to, but we did get the Stars and Stripes newspaper which had all of the goings on in the other theaters. Did you receive any information about uh, in advance maybe or after the fact uh, about dropping the atomic bomb over in uh, Japan? We had no advance notice uh, that when the, so the Germans surrendered in Europe uh, we felt we were going to be uh, on our way to Japan and we started packing our stuff together, getting our stuff together because we knew we were going to be on our way to Japan and we knew it was going to cost us another million men uh, if we att attempted to take Japan because the Japanese, we felt, were never going to surrender. They would go into the mountains, they'd be in the caves, they'd be fighting and we would have had to go from cave to cave rooting out uh, the Japanese soldiers. Uh, we felt that they would never surrender. <coughs> so we were not abreast of that. The, and when we heard that the, the bombs had been uh, dropped and we heard Japan uh, surrendered, you cannot imagine the feeling of relief that we all had because we were sure we were heading uh, for Japan. From that point on, uh, winding down duties over there in the China Theater, did you get orders to come back to the States? What, how did you arrive back into the States? Uh, well, I personally uh, was told, you're a captain, you've been a captain so long because the TO of your organization only called for, a T, uh, for you to be a captain. 
If you sign up for six months, go to Shanghai as a processing officer, processing the soldiers leaving, coming back to the States, where you'll get your majority. I turned to them and said, look, I'm just as eager to get back to the States as they are. And I didn't accept their offer uh, to go to Shanghai. So you know, as soon as the war was over, uh, we were all loaded back up on uh, the planes, flown back to India. And that's a funny story, too. My brother was stationed in India. He was stationed in Calcutta. And we came down on, on the way home. Planes arrived at Calcutta. And I run to the office. He was a clerk in the, the, uh, one of the offices there. And I said, where's uh, Alfred Lasker? And they said, he just left for Karachi this morning. <laughs> I missed him by just a, a matter of hours. And I had brought with me all my white sheets and pillowcases, which I was given uh, as an officer in China. And I brought them all with me, and I was going to give them to him uh, as an enlisted man. He didn't have these. And so I just left them there for whoever wanted them. Wanted, wanted them. And so we were loaded onto a troop ship uh, there, and we were, uh, in a matter of days, we were on our way back home. And we came to the same route as we had come. We went through the Indian Ocean, up through the Suez Canal, through the Mediterranean. And there was uh, storms going on in the Atlantic Ocean at that time, so the captain of the vessel we were on said, I'll sit here at Gibraltar and wait for the storms to settle. Uh, I don't want to take a chance going across such a stormy seas. But all the soldiers on board, we want to get home, we want to get home. So the captain finally relented and through the stormy seas uh, we came back to, uh, to New York. And we went into New York and there's the Statue of Liberty what a welcome sight. And there again, I was told, look, we need a processing officer here. If you'll stay here for six months processing these soldiers coming through, we'll give you your majority. I said, nope, I want to get home too. And uh, I didn't take it. And so I remained the captain until February. And as you say, did I have any time off there? No, we didn't have any time off. So we got back to the States. It was December. And I hadn't had any leave uh, the entire time that I was in China. So I was given two months of terminal leave. So I was in uniform. I was uh, on the payroll through February of 40, uh, 45, 40, 46. 46. 46 I was on uh, terminal leave uh, for two months to make up for all the time off I didn't get while I was in China. Now I know you have many things you purchased in China. Yes. What was the occasion if you didn't have leave and tell us I had time that. off. Uh, I would go into town where the base was uh, outside of the city of Xi'an and uh, there were no Japanese raids coming in at this point. There were no Japanese fields in that area. So I felt content that I could leave. I had another captain who was at that time working uh, under me, and I had a bunch of lieutenants, and I felt that if a raid were to come in, they could have handled it just as well as I could have, and I would go into town. And there's a bunch of rickshaws always waiting at the entrance to our field. You get into a rickshaw and zoom into town uh, by rickshaw. And I went to, as I say, from antique dealer to antique dealer, uh, buying these things. Uh, was it a chore getting it back to the States? Was it a what? Uh, was it a chore? Or the, did you have any problem getting it back to the States? No, I sent them, uh, we were permitted to send them a shoebox uh, package back every month. So for two years, I sent the box, shoebox size, back home. And, uh, my wife was getting all these boxes, and uh, and she never told me what she really liked. So I buy different things. I buy ivories. I buy jades. Waiting for her to say, I like jade. Send me more jade. Never did. I sent porcelains. Fortunately, none of these things ever got broken. Uh, I packed them that well. 
but she never said said more of anything. So I, each box said something entirely different in it. You know, there was no trouble sending out a box, but they only permitted one box a month over the hump because they had to oh, ever, everything would fall right back, back. The mail, well, they used V-mail. They used V-mail, so uh, the mail was reduced to just one little roll of uh, film, so they could have a thousand letters on just a little roll of film, so that didn't take up any weight. But the packages did. Did you have any USO troops or anything come through the area while you were over no, there? No, we had no, we, uh, no, we depended upon the Chinese. Any movies uh, kept abreast of, of what was going on, the fashions? Uh, and how the mood no, was back home? No, we didn't have any movies there, but uh, not up where in Seattle. Back in Chengdu, there were, they did, because uh, that was a bigger base, and uh, I was just in a small base uh, where I was. But we did have uh, USO troops come through, and I, when I get requests for funds from the USO, I never say no. I always have a check for the USO, because the Salvation Army never came up, no other organization ever came up, but the USO did send uh, Joey Brown, uh, Jinx Falkenberg, I remember uh, Blue, Ben Blue, I remember these people that came up there to entertain us. And I felt, I feel today, to this day, that we must support the USO. They did a job then, they are doing a job still today. And then when you came back home, how had the military experience influenced your life? Nothing, nothing. Uh, I came back and I uh, immediately started looking for a job. My wife was working, I, she was, she's an Albanian. I married her when, uh, I met her when I came up to work for the state in 1941. And so we were married during the war. Uh, we were, she came down to uh, Orlando, we were married on Orlando Army Air Base with an Army chaplain marrying us. Her parents, my parents, and my grandmother came down and we were married in 1943 uh, there. And so she was back in Albany working in uh, our store, the New York Specialty Shop, and uh, during the week. And I was in New York looking for a job always. And so, uh, on the weekends, I would come up here to uh, be with her. And so on one of the weekends that I was up here, I saw an ad from the Golems, who were operating the central markets at the time, for a research uh, analyst. So I applied for the job, and they hired me. And so all of a sudden, I said, this is, li after living up here for a few months, I said, this is really living. I thought, yeah, I had to live in New York, because that's where everything took place. I said, this life is so much simpler, so much more pleasant than the rat race in New York. And so we settled in Schenectady. I lived there for five years working for the Golems. And then my in-laws, who owned the store where my wife was working, said they were going to retire, that I could have the store if I wanted it, or they would turn the key in the door. And so I had to decide whether I wanted to work for the Golems for the rest of my life, or if I wanted to be my own boss. So you say if my army influ had any influence on me, it did. But I felt I had to be my own boss. I was the boss of the squadron. We had nobody over me there. Uh, none of the top brass from Cheng Tu ever came up to uh, oversee what I was doing. I was completely on my own, running the uh, entire show by, uh, up there. And so when you're your own boss in the service, you come out, you have to be your own boss. So I took the store from my in-laws and for the next 35 years, I worked downtown in Albany. Uh, I'm running the New York Specialty Shop. Okay, well we have run out of time and I want to thank you very much for your service to our country and for this interview. Well, I hope it, so you probably yeah. bought something lingerie or, uh, very well. or stockings or something. Well, I was thinking it was a store like that. It was near Sherry's and it was, um, they sold other over there. Of course, for women, it's <laughs> another story. 
But there's a young woman who works at Talbot's at Stuyvesant Plaza a couple of years ago who'd gone to China as a um, exchange, they had their little children posed with us, all this stuff, because we were like the freaks that came to town. Well, when you ask about CM, there were no toilets as you reckon. When we opened up the base, they dug a great big pit, mm -hmm. and then they built a little uh, if you want to see what the way I got the e Bronze Star Medal from Schnault, there's the story up there. The plane comes out below the plane on the P-47, and they could see ahead of themselves. Every time there's a new U.S. stamp issue, they issue a first day cover uh, for it. And the manufacturer of these first day covers called me and said, so they used me to represent all U.S. heroes.